Kia ora and welcome to Cinema in Context, where we discuss all things film and the connections between. My name is Jeremy Downing. I'm Sarah Watt. And I'm William Chan. And each month at Cinema in Context, we discuss two films, one current and one retrospective with some connection. It could be the same director, the same actor, or a similar theme. However, over the last couple of months, something significant has occurred in the world of cinema. We had two, I guess, vastly different films on the surface, released at the same time and garner equal amounts of box office buzz mm. Um, mm. In, the, in the form of Barbie, directed by Greta Gerwig, and Oppenheimer, directed by Christopher Nolan. Mm. And uh, they have been dubbed, that event, that weekend, the last few weeks has been dubbed Barbieheimer. Barben. Barbenheimer. 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 Yeah. Barbenheimer. And it's still going. Barbenheimer train is still going strong. It's and lots of commentary. Crazy. Lots of commentary online. Yeah. Uh, people doing five hour double <laughs> double uh, bills. Some people doing it over a couple of nights. Mm. Um, lots of discussion about which way you should watch it. Whether there are any connections at all. And I guess that's the fodder of our discussion today. Mm -hmm. Which is unusual because normally, as you say, we discuss a current film and a retrospective. Is this the first time we've ever done two contemporary films in one podcast? I suspect. No, no, we have done it before. Have we? we? We've done a seven, you know, seven for January, but that, that was a little bit different. That was I different, mean. yeah. But we also did, um, there was another time where we did something. Shall I have a, shall I look it up? Well, I it's, I, I was just idly wondering, but let's not let the, let's not keep the listeners <laughs> waiting. <laughs> Can I just say that, you know, yes, um, there are, there are people um, who I would call either cinephiles or, or desperately ironic who were thinking, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to see Barbie and Oppenheimer. Uh, in quick succession, but also those other people, the civilians, the older lady that I work with who goes to the pictures was like, have you seen Barbie and have you seen Oppenheimer? Yeah. So, you know, it's it has actually become a phenomenon that some people are, aren't even aware that that's a crazy question. I yeah. think people genuinely excited about going to the movies again. This is an incredible, and only if the uh, the writers and, <laughs> and screen actors go to an odd striking, this would be the saviour of cinema. Well, yeah. maybe yeah. this is going to be the zenith, and uh, and then and so it's down, all downhill down from here. Yeah. You know, By the way, this is, yeah. it was uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once and Doctor Strange 2, which you oh, were absent right. for, Sarah. Mm. But we did, we did two, I never would have allowed it. Two, <laughs> mul <laughs> two multiverse yeah. films that oh. came out at the same time. So, same, same, but different? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 All right, well, just warning you, there will be spoilers, and there are, I mean, Oppenheimer, there's not huge spoilers to be had in Oppenheimer, I think it's, you know, it's a historical fact. Mm -hmm. Barbie, though, there's some lovely little moments that, That's right. uh, I guess, have become part of the zeitgeist, though, so. Yeah. Yeah, either way, um, you can decide whether you want to jump on ahead if you haven't seen either film. Or well, I think we've decided, we've, we've agreed, haven't we? The whole world has now seen both films, <laughs> yeah, so true. I think we're all good. <laughs> yeah, true, true. Yeah. Well, um, William, give us a bit of a summary of uh, of these films. All right. So, guys, 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 I just watched the latest summer blockbuster from a popular auteur based on a defining icon of the 20th century that remains very much a part of our culture to this day. Our protagonist lives in the magical city surrounded by a desert wasteland where anything is possible and dreams are made into reality. Every day is filled with fun and excitement within this ward utopia. However, after receiving advice from a venerable mentor with crazy hair, <laughs> our hero must venture beyond the confines of the city to confront a monolithic patriarchy, hell-bent on controlling the public perception of the hero's persona in the public sphere. But enough about Barbenheimer! No! Okay, wait, 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 I've got, I've got one can, more. Can we guess before you do the reveal? Yes. Okay, no, but then you just go. I mean, uh, for the next one. Because okay. I was thinking, or should I guess No, now? that's both. Them. No, I know, but I've, I've, there's going to be another one. I've got, okay. a, I've got a feeling of what it was going to be. Here we oh, go. Okay. <laughs> uh, enough about Doctor Strange and everywhere, yeah, everyone. That's once. right. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Keep going. The multiverse of madness. Guys, guys, guys. <laughs> I just watched the July 2023 smash hit from a popular auteur. It's a visually dazzling film with an insanely stacked cast that has much to say about the role of the creator and how relationships can be strained due to differing perspectives. Somewhere in the American Southwest is a town surrounded by desert wasteland mm. where anything seems to be possible. However, once you arrive, government types will try to stop you from leaving. Mm. Although the wonderfully pink sets may be pure candy-coated nostalgia for the 50s, there's an underlying sense of unease and maybe dread as nuclear testing mm. might just be happening in the distance. 
The film may be intercut with a framing device shot in stark black and white, while Margot Robbie might also give the film a heartfelt conclusion as she muses about the meaning of life and the role of narrative convention. Oh gosh. Ultimately, while I really liked the film and can appreciate its ambitions, the, the film didn't quite live up to its potential, for me at least. What cannot be denied is the bravura filmmaking at a time when such a thing is in short supply within the studio system. But enough about Asteroid City! No. Yeah. I was thinking, um, don't worry darling, until you brought in Margot Robbie. I was thinking Asteroid City, but then I thought I don't remember Mar Mar Margot Robbie being in Asteroid she, City. She's the actress at the very, very end when it flashes back to them, you know, going going through the scene. Oh, spoiler alert, oh. I haven't seen this movie. Oh, I, I'm so sorry. Um, sorry, Margot Robbie makes <laughs> a cameo. You won't remember. That's okay. Oh, interesting. That's yes. right. Oh. So, Ash I saw Asteroid City after watching Barbenheimer. Same. And it's like, this is the love child between the two movies. Actually. Oh. It is so, the perfect medium. And you know, if... if <laughs> Hypothetically, we were doing the Patreon thing and we were going to say what would be your third film to go with it. Mine would also have been <laughs> Asteroid City because it does. It feels like the intersecting set mm. in some ways. Mm. So there we are. Free Patreon uh, uh, <laughs> content. content. <laughs> a bit of a snippet about what we might discuss later right. on. So I feel as though in those brilliant introductions, William might already have drawn all the dots, uh, you know, connected all the dots. But let's go. Yeah. What do we think? Well, I just find it fascinating how, again kind of how the Barbenheimer meme started was because you have these two diametrically opposed styles, right? Yeah. One, a movie about a toy, a, a, you know, super pink, super girly Barbie. On the other hand, a black and white somber period piece about, you know, the advent of the nuclear bomb. Mm. And then you go into it and, and people, audiences around the world, as you guys have said, are really, really into both movies. Mm. Often, you know, watched in succession. Mm. I think that's fascinating. And they're both films that are named after their title character. They're mm. both character studies. They both, um, you know, deal with... <laughs> existential crises. Existential crisis. crises, yeah, well, crises. I, I, I think there's some really amazing connections about these films that... Were I'm... completely unintended. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but... No, it you're right. It would have been completely yeah. unintended. Yeah. And I, I, I'm so sorry, Jeremy, but I, it occurs to me that if these films hadn't come out within a day of one another... You know, if it had been a month, well, six months, or even a year apart, we might not have drawn the comparisons, <laughs> but they seem <laughs> glaring. Mm, you know, yeah. quite aside from both set in the middle of a desert sort yeah. of thing, you know, they seem glaring. It's like all a counter-programming that it's, it's like counter-complementary programming mm -hmm. because it's not like people have chosen one or the other. It's they've really complemented each other, and I don't think there's been any. Um, you know, obviously, Barbie's made far more. Far, you know, much more money than uh, Oppenheimer, mm. but I also don't think Oppenheimer's lost any money. In, oh, in Oppenheimer's some ways, gained is so much more because yeah. of Oppenheimer. Mm. Yeah, people yeah. are sort of spurred to to go see both. Which it, I strange. just saw today that Oppenheimer is the highest grossing World War Two film of all time, wow. and the highest, the fifth highest grossing R-rated film of all time, and it's a three-hour partly black and white talkie. Like, yeah. what is this? He's very fortunate, Chris. <laughs> you know, Chris, Your my buddy. mate Chris, yeah, yeah. yeah, Chris Nolan, <laughs> he's very fortunate actually to ride on the coattails of the Barbenheimer thing. And I'll tell you for why. I know that he has a built-in audience, and I know that we all think that he is an extraordinary auteur, and we would see anything that he created. Um, but let's be honest, things like the three-hour and nine-minute uh, running time, things like the it's very male-heavy talky, things like, I mean, it is an R-rated film as well. So, you know, here's the thing. My little neighbours next door with the little girls went to the Barbie movie. They would not be seeing Oppenheimer. Okay. Mm. Um, but but in by comparison, uh, older colleague at work saw both and thought Barbie was very silly indeed, but thought that Oppenheimer was really good. So I guess all I'm saying, though, is you know how we've spoken about Chris Nolan's work in recent times and we'll see it and we'll talk about Tenet and we'll go and we'll maybe rewatch it. But we're frustrated by some of either the narrative stuff or the inability to hear what people are saying, you know, just a minor thing yeah. in, uh, in the cinematic world. And yet I think I feel as though. On paper, um, they w maybe not, not everybody would have found it an interesting thing to go to, but because of everything that's going on, they're like, well, yes, I will. Mm. I think that's extraordinary. Both auteurs as well. Like, I think yeah. Greta Gerwig is emerging as... Absolutely. ...as quite the director. Yes. And, um, 
you know, I w- I'd love to see her make a musical. I think that was the thing that really mm. struck out to me initially in Barbie. I was yeah. watching these amazing musical. There was, there was two two musical sequences, right? Mm. Because you've got the one where she gets ready for the day, which she's not singing, but it's ostensibly a musical yes, sequence, yeah, that's right. right? Yeah, she may as well be singing Lizzo's lyrics from yeah. the, from the soundtrack. Um, and, and then, then the dance sequence, no, yeah. I think the, oh, the oh. big party where she. Oh, she renounces yes, that wonderful, she's, wonderful. She's thinking about death. Yeah. Um, and then you've got the traveling to the other world. Like, there's just lots of set pieces. Yeah. And of course, yes, there the big are. Ken dance sequence. Yeah. Um, I'd love to see her tackle, tackle a musical because she's effectively done it with this film. Well, also in Frances Ha. Do you remember Frances Ha? Mm-hmm. I remember it back in the day when it came out, black and white. Um, Is it her first film? I think it was well, her as a first... director, right? Because oh. she was in Greenberg and other things before. Yeah, but did she... Oh, hang on then. Because yeah. she starred in Frances Ha as yeah. well, didn't she? Did she direct it? I thought she did. I don't know. I don't um, think I've seen it. So, um, but anyway, that's got musical numbers, these sorts of things, because there's a really um, cute scene of her walking through, I'm going to guess, New York, because those guys always do it in New York, uh, and kind of dancing through Central Park sort mm. of thing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, she's de- she definitely has it in her for... Well, obviously she has it in her for whole musical things, doesn't oh. she? Mm. Since you bring up musicals, can I, can I just say, guys, that uh, I, I think on a personal level, you guys know me, I love musicals, but I'm also hypercritical about musicals. Yes, you are. You um, have high standards. Yes, for, for musicals. Like, things that you... I know, I'm sorry, Jeremy, but you love stuff like In the Heights. And I was like, eh, it was all right. Um, stuff like well, the Rob Marshall movies. I hate that guy, and he makes terrible uh, movies. <laughs> my opinion, my yeah, opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, same. Well, yeah. <laughs> I love Chicago. Chicago's I think it's a, a great film. Chicago's pretty good. Chicago's so Mary, good. Mary Poppins Returns. No oh way. my god, that's amazing! That was, a, film. that was my worst film of the year. Liz. I will give you nine. Well, nine, oh, nine, nine was awful. Well, nine was awful. The musical's terrible. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's it's the. I mean, apart from the Disney remake thing, it's the other thing that's kept me away from the. The Little Mermaid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, sorry. Um, the musical numbers in Barbie are so good. Mm. They're so good. Especially, you know, you sat through almost two hours of a film. I think Barbie is slightly overlong. It needs some snipping. Mm. Um, but then you head into the, the final Ken Beach off. Mm. And it's this beautiful, vibrant, exuberant, what, 20 minutes of just musical goodness. And like, my goodness, does the, does the film end on a high note? Like, uh, there's there's a lot of homages to great cinema that mm-hmm. that are so on the nose, but they work. Like, of course, there's the opening sequence from 2001, which was the first trailer. There's that moment uh, with the um, the sort of what's what's that shot where you zoom and you, uh, you the, the, Kubrick, the trombone uh, shot, the trombone <laughs> shot <laughs> from Vertigo and on or Vertigo yeah. or Jaws later yeah. on, which is the one they mimic yeah. on the yeah. beach. And then there's that singing in the rain reference yes, it in, is. in the dance sequence with yeah. Ken, which is just, when it got to that point, I was like, this is... A, this, it's she's, cinematic ecstasy. Th- there's also a rage. lot of uh, Jacques Tati. Um, yes. Have you guys seen Playtime? Mm-mm. No, but, but she's mentioned him because oh, there's right. a there's a letterbox an interview or article, article um, okay. that has an accompanying thing of all the films oh, that Greta Gerwig's cool, referenced cool, cool, cool. in... Okay. Um, in Barbie. Barbie. Yeah. So, yeah. The Mattel offices is like ripped straight from uh, from Playtime. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. There, there is just so much fun to be had in this film. And I think one of the other connections with these movies is the, the, the politics behind them outside of the film is, is interesting because with Barbie, you know, you've got some people really protesting in the States about the representation of gender and kind mm-hmm. of people misunderstanding its commentary on patriarchy. And, and, and then with Oppenheimer, it's like, the, and this is the thing that I have struggled with outside of the film itself is what version of the story they're telling and and um, whose voices were ignored in that story. I mean, people were killed in the States from that test and the fallout is still affecting families and no there's no intended. mention of... They sort of mention an indigenous people's displacement, but they don't mention the indigenous community that lives over the hill sure. or, or the Mexican-Americans that live over the hill that um, still weren't even told that there was fallout mm. after the bombing and, bombings in Japan. Sure, sure. Um, there's, there's a lot of stuff like that that I felt very uncomfortable watching Oppenheimer. Um, but both of the, both those movies have very clear political choices. Yeah, that, and they're both about patriarchy. Well. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just that Barbie uses the word a lot more. Yeah. Um, my husband Doug said that, you know, if you were doing a drinking game, then every time they said the word uh, patriarchy, then you'd be well smashed pretty early on. <laughs> it's you know? funny you say that because when I was watching Oppenheimer, which I watched after Barbie, mm-hmm. you know, maybe a week after yes. Barbie, I, all I had, and I said this in our chat, all I had in my head was that line going, 
are, excuse me, are you watching The Godfather? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because in my mind, that is exact what what Nolan was doing in that movie. It was pretty much a, all white guys um, with Florence Pugh and Emily Blunt. Mm. You know, poor Florence Pugh has the worst character in that movie. Emily Blunt manages to make something magical of her moments. Mm. Yes. Um, but it is, it ain't no Barbie in terms of with female representation. Female, or just well written characters, and apart from Oppenheimer and. Um, RDJ right. uh, no one else in that film is very I don't think very well written it's... I think both women are relatively well written if you can accept that um, it's either the point of view of Oppenheimer or it's how those women were in Oppenheimer's life if you get what I mean because obviously it isn't Mrs. Oppenheimer's story and it's not um, the the mistress's story I know but you don't even know their names right no, I don't know. You know I don't know that at all. Um, I mean, I know so many characters' names in Barbie. There's Barbie. There's Barbie. There's Barbie. There's, Barbie, there's Ken. There's Ken. There's Ken. Sorry. And Ken. Alan. Yeah. And um, Alan. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I know. I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. And I know that some people had an issue, perhaps, with Florence Pugh just be, being kind of maybe well, sweaty and nudy and the whole thing. She's sweaty, nudy, and crazy. Like she's she's. I don't know what the not quite a manic pixie dream girl. She's just <laughs> manic pixie girl. <laughs> but she also looks amazing. Like, I didn't begrudge any of the scenes with Florence Pugh kind of sitting around, lolling around in an armchair um, I did. naked. I did, because there was no... I was like, Christopher Nolan cannot write romance. No. It was so awkward. He's not a romance scene, guy. And he's, he's quoting his famous quote. Sure, sure. Like, My while she's on God. top of it. Like, yeah. yeah. I'm like, well, I mean, you know, when you're bored and you're like, okay, let's just grab this random book from the shelf. Oh, this is a history-defining quote right here. It's, it did not work for me. I would say that Emily Blunt's character was thankless up until the scene when she testifies mm. and she's oh, clear amazing. and she builds into the sassy, not sassy actually, just kind Pretty of sassy. embittered <laughs> kind of, and, and she's tremendous in that. And I think that was... One of the best pieces of acting I've absolutely seen Absolutely brilliant. And I, and I thought, not exactly, it's worth waiting for. I don't mean that. It's just that it, it validates or vindicates that role for her. Right. That absolutely. she isn't just playing... The the embittered wife. Yeah, you know, like the wife in First Man when Ryan Gosling's the dude on going to the moon and yeah. stuff. Right. It's all, same, all those it's wife same character. characters. It's like uh, the yeah. wife and the whore really is the two characters. Sure. Got. And I just, I just was like. Bleh. May I just say because I know that our listeners um, have been shaking their fists at their uh, the the speakers um, <laughs> for some time. I did just want to say I did look it up. Don't worry, uh, Noah Baumbach, yeah. who of course is Greta Gerwig's husband, mm. was the director of Greta or, uh, or Francis Ha and the so, co-writer of Barbie. That's right. But yeah. I just wanted to say because she didn't direct Francis Ha, and I wanted to put the record straight on that. But Can she I, was the star. The the strength of the writing in Barbie, especially when it's com mm. this commentary on patriarchy on what it means for women and what it means for men and what it means for everyone in between it's it's so clearly um the the influence of both of that that couple i yes. think it was so clearly um yeah felt and that's not to take away anything from good 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 but i think there's just this balanced perspective in yeah. that movie and in that script that did they both write marriage story I don't know. Oh, did he do Marriage Story? Yeah. He directed oh. Marriage Story, and I wouldn't at all be... I mean, they seem mm. like a very collaborative artistic couple, mm. so I wouldn't be at all surprised, and I know it's based on um, scenes from a marriage and mm. whatnot, no, but, you know, in terms of the script, I wouldn't be at all surprised if the two of them had worked on that to make it feel like two authentic characters, mm. one one wife, one husband, uh, fighting and arguing and lamenting, you mm. know, Um so I think in that regard, can I just speak to Barbie? Because we're sort of talking about it as if it's um, a, an unreservedly great film. And I don't know for sure that that is what you guys think. I gave it three and a half. I felt that its flaws were these. To start with, the banality, although hold, hold, the, hold the line, hold my beer or whatever they say. <laughs> um, the banality of, hi, Barbie, hi, Barbie, hi, Mummy, hi, Ken, hi, Ken, hi, hi, Ken on the beach, and da-da-da. It started to get really tired. Mm. And I thought, what? And then I, but, but then it became an actual thing. The minute she goes, do you ever think about dying or whatever the line is? And suddenly it turns into what it's meant to be. So then I thought, oh, I see what they're doing here. They're talking about the fact that at its essence, a Barbie doll, not a great representation of um, the female body or of, um, what's the word, feminism and all that. And we'll talk about how the Barbie doll came to be. Um, 
you know, when we used to play with dolls, it really, it wasn't very deep. It was a, it was a very superficial surface kind of thing. So how clever. You set that up and then you smash it and you send her into the real world and it's cute and it's insightful. So fine. But I didn't like the ending at all. I thought that that turgid wandering off into the clouds with um, Ruth, Ruth Handler. Ruth, yeah, Ruth Handler. Um, I, I thought it's gone really flat, really slow. She doesn't know how to end it. You know, in, in improv, and I know that we've all done improv, yeah. it's like, find an ending, yeah. find an ending. I, <laughs> I shout that at the cinema screen sometimes. Find your ending. And I didn't know that they could or, or you know, didn't think that she did. I have stuff to respond to about that. Like, yeah. I, if I were to give, give both movies scores, um, I think I would give both of them three and a half as well. Right. Um, I really yeah. liked both of them, and I really, again, as I said in the intro, appreciated their ambitions. Yes. I think they're both just way off from being great movies. Sure. They're very, very good movies, yeah. but not great. And, yeah. and nowhere near masterpiece, I think. Yeah. Um, but my, my issues with Barbie are, are somewhat similar to yours, a little bit different. I just find the world building to be really confusing. Um, mm. And I, I think everything around that is quite poorly written. Mm. Um, it's very, very nebulous. It's very, very vague. And you may argue, like, that's kind of not the point of Barbie, but then so much of the plot, and it is a very plot-heavy movie, mm. ties into the world building. And when the world building makes no sense, why, why should I care about the plot? Do you mean uh, the world building as in, when it's in Barbie Dream World, it's clearly yes. within, the, it's within play, yeah. but then she drives through a desert and makes it into the real world. Which is cool, but yeah. then when they start mixing it up, and the yeah. Mattel execs go into Barbie World, and, yeah. and it's like, why are we... Why are we doing this? It would make a lot of sense if Barbie World was, you know, plastic, artificial, really, really stylized, and the real world was the real world, and it starts off like that. But then the real world becomes artificial and plastic, and there's just no differentiation. There's no reason for Will Ferrell to be in this movie and to go into the Barbie land, because his character makes one point, a couple of jokes, and mm. he doesn't do anything. Um, similarly, I think my main issue with the movie is... There's a pair of characters, a mother and daughter. Yeah. And I, th I just think they're so poorly served. America Ferreira plays the mum. Mm. And I know that she has this monologue and at the end of Act 2. And, mm. you know, ac across the world, apparently, there's been applause. And yes, people are has. really into it. Yeah, and women feel heard and they feel seen. But and to it's me, like... it's just... Again, I'm, I'm not a woman. <laughs> yeah. Um, I hate this kind of writing. Yeah. Which is didactic and saying... You know, to the people at the back, yeah. this is what the movie is about. It's like, yeah. come or, on. Or to the people at the back, this is what it's like to be a mom. Yeah, yeah that's um, interesting, William, because it is. It was really like, yeah, we know this already. And then I thought, oh, I'm not being all hoity-toity about it. Maybe we don't all know this, but I feel like we mostly do. We've heard that narrative before. And, and the, film, the film is really good in portraying that narrative without making it text. Yeah. You know, subtext is fine. But then throughout many points, they, they, there's, there's that speech, which is, yeah. There's, um, there's bits at the beginning where Helen Mirren is the narrator. That's a pretty good choice, but she just chips in and undercuts jokes. Yeah. And it's like, we're not dumb. Like, I understand what a visual thing is. You don't need to explain it to me. Um, so I found, like, it, it wanted to have its cake and eat it too, but it was also pitching it at a very, very lowest common denominator, which made the smart comedy not feel so smart anymore. But is, but is it the lowest common denominator? And I guess, do we mean like six-year-old girls? But, but like... And I don't mean that well, they're stupid, thing, I just mean they're six. I also... <laughs> my, sorry. I, I'm sorry, the audience. I really like this movie. I'm just... Yeah. I, I have things, you know, I'll have bones to put because I think it could have been great. Um, sure, sure. I don't think it's a movie for children. Mm. I, I, do you guys? Like, I, I had six-year-old girls in my audience and they were climbing over chairs. Like, they were bored out of their minds. Right. Um, it's a film for adults and for people who have nostalgia for the product. Yes, yes. Um, but not for kids. It's uh, and for a toy movie to not be for children, I think there is like this, this mental mm. disconnect there or, or values disconnect. I, I don't know. I agree with you about the world, definitely about the world building, and I think mm. some of that logic. And um, and I don't think it's a five out of five. I love the film because of what it did beyond just being a movie. And I think I do think that speech is like it's. It was incredible. I found it really landed and I didn't mm. find it didactic myself because I think the movie, that is the core of the film. Like the mm -hmm. film needed to get to that I think place. perhaps for me, if they had fleshed out America Ferrer's character or her daughter more, it would have worked better for me. Mm. But they're just, they're, they're strawmen or, or whatever the female equivalent Straw is. Straw women. <laughs> Straw women. Uh, 
Like, like the girl when she has that that whole speech about how Barbie is, you know, she's fascist. And it's like, cool, that that's a that's a point of view. But to put it into a one minute speech and then to leave it forever, it's mm. like movie. I can see what you're doing, and I don't like it. Like it's it's very very much. Oh right, th- this is well, at least it felt like uh, this is to quiet the people on the internet because people will have this argument. And and then what happens to them? Nothing. Nothing really. I mean, they, they repair the relationship, and she kind of goes back to work. Like those characters are, are just not very well fleshed out, not very well thought through. If I, I think if there was more character there, I do think I would have connected with that a lot more. Right. Mm. Yeah. I guess I just see their characters as influencing the main character of Barbie. Like that right. speech is what is the catalyst for her having this this moment at the end that Sarah you didn't like. You know, mm. I, I think that that speech. Is helping name and frame what it means to be a woman for this effectively. I mean, Barbie is an experience, right? Mm-hmm. So she's helping her understand some of the crises that she's feeling, which is from American Ferreira. I can't help but think of Inside Out when we're talking about this because you've got that Riley storyline and then Sadness and Joy and how those right. two storylines have to work together because mm-hmm. Riley's influencing Sadness and Joy and Sadness and Joy are influencing mm-hmm. Riley, but they're different kind of journeys. Um, I. I I don't know. I think the movie is has. I think the movie did have its cake and eat it too because it had to tell a story that celebrated this product, mm. as well as critique. Absolutely, it had all to the critique things it. that it needed to. And, yeah. I, and I thought that movie had to do so many different things to work. Um, and so, whilst I do agree about world building and and the the rules of the world mm. and how they travelled to and fro and, and that sort of stuff, I don't know. I think the movie was this like pastiche of. A whole range of different ideas that at the end of the day I, I was satisfied with how it culminated in Ken's existential crisis being resolved Barbie's existential, existential crisis really not being resolved mm. but that was okay yeah um, and then that wonderful moment at joke at the end where I just did not know what the final moment was going to be <laughs> and then when she you know oh, she's going for a job interview what's yeah. she going for and then she goes you know she says what she says I don't want to ruin that for people but I can't remember it but oh, you don't have to um, tell me when the final line of the movie where they drop Barbie off to go see somebody um, and it's it's and she says I'm here to see my blah 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 do you not remember? No, okay, I never spoiler remember. Alert. I never remember the. I'm end here of to see <laughs> my gynecologist. Oh yeah, that's yeah, right. That's yeah. true. That's and very funny. All this talk very about good. genitals and and things like that throughout yeah. the film. You both raised. I, oh my god, I got to pick up on two things. So one, the audience, very interesting point. She, she, Greta Gerwig, I absolutely get. I think nostalgia and people or or women my age who grew up playing or anybody sorry who grew up playing with Barbie in the I had a Ken 70s doll. 80s 90s <laughs> I had a Ken doll as a kid uh-huh. just saying. Um, you see I didn't have Barbie and I should just say because I'm quite English and my mother is even more English uh, hence my being half English um, we weren't allowed Barbie um, and we weren't was allowed was there a British equivalent of yes there Barbie? is so Cindy Mildred oh. no no Cindy <laughs> So Cindy is um, a slightly slightly fuller figured, um, still by today's standards, probably like more like the perfect kind of uh, vital statistics. But anyway, she's slightly fuller figured and her heels go slightly closer to the floor. And so Cindy, we were allowed to play with Cindy, um, but we did. But there was no boy equivalent for Cindy. So we did have a Ken doll just because we're a very heterosexual household and somebody needs to rub plastic bits with Cindy. <laughs> And it wasn't going to be other Cindy's, so there we go. And um, so, so we did have a Cindy. We had a Skipper doll. I think hey, Skipper was nice. Skipper. Was she? Um, she's Barbie's little sister. Yes, that's yeah. Right. Okay. So there was a little bit of cross pollination mm. there. I have to admit. But anyway, it was Cindy all the way. Um, Cindy had a house. She had. Don't worry for us because Cindy had great like houses and all stuff like that. What uh, what 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 amused and this. I guess ties into the world building side of things. I thought the establishment of the dream world was quite charming because I, I laughed a lot at things that were uh, resonant that I hadn't thought about for 30, 40, however many years. But for example, the fact that she doesn't need stairs because yeah. she never came downstairs. You always just moved her from your hand to wherever she was going. Mm. And I guess, William, my riposte to your your issues with the the world building perhaps would be that there was always this blurred line when you're playing with the to- toys and therefore you know you could move Barbie from one place to another and there was no logic to it and it didn't matter and in a way you might have made yourself part of the story in a way and it you know what I mean yeah. so maybe it was touching on that I, I think I love all that 
all that stuff. Yeah. But it's when they muddle the line between the real world and the Barbie world, and it's like, okay, you, you've set up something here, <clears throat> but you haven't paid it off, is all. Well. Sure, sure, yeah. sure, sure. What about um, the joke? I love some of the jokes, though. Like when she turns on the shower and she's yeah. like, oh, it's too hot. That's and right. And there's no so water. Funny. Absolutely. It's so brilliant. Yeah. And, the, and the toast and all the things. Yeah. Yeah. And the drinking and there's no. Th- all of that. I yeah. thought, oh, wow, someone's really paid attention. And that's quite delightful. For, for me, the, the intro sequence is delightful. But the moment that really just made it sing was when the ambulance pulls up. And it opens up like a place. Yes. Absolutely brilliant. Oh my god. Yeah. 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 Like I never played with Barbie as a kid, but I've played with toys just like that. Yeah. And it gave me like real nostalgic feels. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that was brilliant. And so yeah. despite my being a Cindy, not a Barbie person, totally got it. And that mm. was amazing. Um, so in that regard, the world building and whatnot was quite charming. The audience thing though, as I was sort of saying, interesting. Because this is exactly the sort of film that mothers of a certain age are going to take their now daughters to because odds are their daughters have grown up with Barbie. And yes, those little ones aren't going to get the the meta message. They're not even probably going to like be laughing at things like water not coming out of the shower and things. Mm. It just is what it is. And there were little girls in the... I went to a, a premiere, as you know, mm. of Barbie. We all had to wear pink. We got, got our nails done. It was quite charming. And there were loads of little girls there. And I did say to a couple of little girls at the end, did you enjoy that? What did you think of it? And they were like, yes, it was really good. And I thought, oh, all right, interesting. Because I didn't really know whether they would be like, nah, mm. it was weird or boring or hard or whatever. I think young women would pick up some version of the message that the film's trying to get across, yeah. right? Is that you life as a woman is more complicated than this plastic pink world that you're presented. I think there's something in there. But, but there's also enough in the movie, right? As you say, all the set pieces and the fun and the the the, the tacit teaching around the relationship. Yeah. You don't need a man. You don't mm. need to go out with Ken and so all that stuff absolutely and is vice is, versa. is accessible, yeah. isn't it? Um, do you know, there's something as well like, I do feel like this movie was felt very collaborative and you know Margot Robbie was a producer right so she was mm. attached to the film before Greta Gerwig was attached to the film mm. and um, there is this real collaborative energy about the movie uh, clearly directed by um, a very confident competent I'm really excited to see what Greta Gerwig does next director um, that I think was really missing from Oppenheimer you know Nolan has incredible collaborators I mean mm. the music in Oppenheimer is just mm. amazing mm. I thought it was fantastic um, and you know he's got you know he's got a lot of technicians that he's built in his team, but I I just I'm getting more and more annoyed as you know and you know how I reacted to that movie afterwards because I messaged you guys I couldn't help myself mm-hmm. I was so angry I have a bath I very rarely have a bath I was so angry at the end of Oppenheimer you took a bath <laughs> I just, and I just was like what were you so angry about um, I think there's this arrogance about Nolan's films that is growing that that the storyline is going to be so compelling that. I will be along for the ride with all of his purest perspectives. Right. Mm-hmm. And I just did not think that focusing on Oppenheimer in this way warranted mm. this level of attention. I think he created an abhor- abhorrent piece of technology. And people go, oh, the film's kind of dealing with that. I was like, I don't think the film did its due diligence to care for the voices that have been ignored in Hollywood around the bombing of Nagasaki and um, Hiroshima. 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 And I think that there, there is a complete lack of indigenous voice, complete lack of Mexican-American voice. And I just thought this movie is a big wank fest around the, 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 these guys creating this ultimate weapon of mass destruction and, at the, and, and celebrating his relationship with Einstein. I just was like, oh, this is just one big... I hear you, but does every story have to... I mean, it is called Oppenheimer. And there's, in in terms of the Japanese representation, there's dozens of films that have that stuff. Yeah. Right, like documentary and fiction. Um, And is it not enough uh, to to know that the audience, because this is an instance where, you know, the young Barbie audience is not seeing Oppenheimer. So Mm -hmm. let's assume it is adults who have learned a little bit of history and understand the name Hiroshima. Uh, And therefore, yeah, is it not enough to think, well, we don't need to see it not because we'll think worse of Oppenheimer if we do, but because we kind of know, we, we, we have that foreknowledge, and yet this story is about one man who didn't see it either, um, who didn't see the product of his, you know what I mean, didn't see the product of the, the misery of, of his bomb, but who still had his own existential crisis around it. Because, Jimmy, I, I've thought about that scene where he um, goes to a screening, a screening room, 
and you, he sees the, the the horrors inflicted upon you know the, the Jap- Japanese, uh, but you as the audience do not see it. You just see his expression. Um, and I, I've seen you know a lot of the the discourse. Oh, cat! Uh, a lot of the discourse online. <laughs> I'm like Doug. From, you said a cat online. A cat. No. I'm like Doug from Up. Um, <laughs> but uh, where was I? Yes, um, a lot of the discourse online. You know whether whether or not it was appropriate to show or not show the horrors. And I. I think I end up landing on the the path of yeah. I mean, it's that that's kind of not the point of the movie, mm. uh, whether or not Nolan decrees it so. Um, you know what the horrors are, mm. kind of to what you, you're saying, Sarah. Like, it is not up to the movie to educate us about the horrors of the nuclear bomb because we we know the horrors and we've seen this so many times, both footage and photography. Now. The, the flip side of, the, of that is if they did show footage of, of the, the, the horrors, um, there also could it be, there could be a chance that it may be seen as exploitative. Mm. I don't know. Mm. Possibly. I, I think back to the movie um, Waltz with Bashir, uh, Ari Foman, and that movie, it's animated and mm. it ends on real life footage. And mm. It was like a gut punch, mm. right? a real gut punch. But that's because we weren't as aware yes. of... The, the Israeli conflict. Oh, tro- yeah. Exactly, the, those the atrocities. atrocities. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm not advocating for mm. this movie mm. to do things that it's not actually trying to do. So I'm not advocating for, even though I said those things are missing in the movie, I'm not saying you put those things in and it solves the problem. Not right. at all. Like, the movie is a very clear character study about yes. Oppenheimer. Um, I think my issue with the movie was my issue, was always going to be my issue with the movie. And it's one of the reasons I didn't want to see the film, because I was like... I don't want to go and watch a three-hour character study of this man that made this, that led this team to make mm. this horrible bomb, mm. and we're just going to get another America, America, rah rah, you know. But, but I, it's but not. it's not because it's you completely never, not. There's no way, at no point in the film, I think, do are we under any illusion? I, I I feel as though we don't think. Oh, maybe it was a good thing to have done, though. Maybe it was. Oh, I shouldn't have used it like that. But otherwise, I don't think I, that at I all. Think, Honestly, the most horrifying moment of the movie, as the film portrays it, is after the Trinity test goes, you know, not without a hitch, but quite successfully, and then you just see these faceless GIs load this death machine onto their truck. And drive, and drive it off. away. And you be... see it in the distance. Yeah. And they're there, and, and the scientists, you know, they may agree or disagree, but there's no way you can stop history now. Um, yeah. That, that was, it, to, to me at least, it was definitely not America Rara, um... And America Rara seemed to be the furthest thing from its mind. And the fact that he is then, uh, he, Oppenheimer, is then going, okay, this is completely out of my hands, out of my control. Could you let me know when it happens? Can you just keep me potent? They're like, sure, we'll do whatever we can, you know. And to, to know that you've created this thing and you've done your job, and also it was around physics, which you love. What was it that all he wanted from life was physics and... There were, there's, there's some beautiful yeah. sentence about the fact that, you know, he lives for two things and one of them is physics. And um, imagine that, that you use your passion and your knowledge and you build this thing for the sake of physics and mm-hmm. learning and knowledge, not for the sake of genocide. Um, and then it's taken and you've done it and what? And oh, and then it's like, oh, well, shoot. what? A- yeah, but he, in real life, he was quite supportive of the bombing of of those places you know there's Mm. I just think that there's this negligence in what this film actually is doing outside of the movie so it's like whitewashing or physics washing or something yeah I I guess it's just a personal thing and Mm. a political thing for me I'm just not interested in the story I don't want to see this man celebrated I don't want to see a version of the story again like we're we're Again, watching a version of a story that is ignoring marginalized voices, it's yeah. ignoring the actual people. And again, the Japanese people is one thing. Mm-hmm. It's the communities in America, that, the Pacific yeah. communities. Think about the Pacific yeah. Ocean, and it's not just America, that's other countries. But yeah. like, think about those voices that have never been heard, and, and we're still suffering the effects of And that would have been a totally different film, you're energy. right. And yeah. it could have been a film that was set in the desert around... Um, no, I don't want to get this confused with the Wes Anderson. Which one is Los Alamos? That's Oppenheimer. Oh, good. Okay, good. Um, oh, not Asteroid City. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. okay. So, yeah, you, yeah you, they, they, it could have been a story, I suppose, around... 
I don't know if I'm not saying that he should have made a different story. Yeah, I, yeah, I didn't know what want you're to saying. And I guess added to that was all of my usual Nolan things. They weren't as bad as in Tenet. No, because no, you could hear, right? I could hear, but there yeah. were definitely moments where I couldn't hear. It was really? there's hallway walking That's sequences. So interesting. And I'm like, I don't know what they're saying right now. Or it's like, I have to work yeah. to yeah. hear what they're saying. Um, I didn't notice any switching of IMAX. I'm assuming the whole thing was filmed in IMAX this time. The whole thing was, but there was a little bit of switching. Okay, so I I just, mm. Thankfully, I didn't notice this time. No, that's <laughs> great, which means it was enthralling. And I, I found the whole thing... Uh, I mean, look, uh, if I can say content aside, in terms of bravura filmmaking, I found it incredibly compelling. And uh, I, I, I can't even remember the words I th felt at the time. It was just like this... Extra I did, I said extraordinary... It's an extraordinary film without being a perfect film or a brilliant film or a, um, what were you saying, a masterpiece. Mm. But it was an extraordinary film and it was the first time in my life, or probably any of our lives, that I have seen so much IMAX oh my God. In, one, it, in one film. Dialogue scenes in IMAX? Amazing. What? Like... Uh, okay, Chris Nolan. <laughs> like, yeah, like that. Extraordinary. Yeah. And and I didn't Black and even white mind. And IMAX. All right. And, and I didn't even good. mind. Like sometimes I find flights of fancy or magical yeah. realism a little bit annoying or grating. I didn't even mind that sometimes to give us this the the, the feeling. Uh, of, of of whatever it was that Oppenheimer was feeling or what they were creating, oh. they would do those bursts of like, oh, yeah. you know, I didn't even mind. I was like, I am with this, you know. <laughs> I, an another text I thought of when I was watching it, and I don't, I know neither of you have got to this yet, but it's the the season three, the return season of Twin Peaks, which I've always gone about. Mm. There is an episode in that where they focus on the this test, mm. and David Lynch, David Lynches it, yeah, mm. and uses it as a vehicle of ultimate evil and horror that is right. so unsettling. You literally go inside the nuclear bomb mm. for about fifteen minutes, mm. um, and I just and that that sat with me while I was watching Oppenheimer uh. as a tonal mood choice. Sure, right. that was so unsettling, and I've watched that episode multiple times, and it's mm -hmm. brilliant. Um, Nine Inch Nails <clears throat> performs in that, or the Nine Inch Nails, because they're slightly in an alternate reality. Right, um, right. Uh, you know, there's some really creepy additional mm. David Lynch stuff in there. Um, so I, I, had, I had a few different things in my mind. Barbie, Barbie in one, one side of my shoulder saying, is this the Godfather? Mm. And then I had David Lynch's mm. incredible episode from Twin Peaks 3 on the other right. side. Mm. Um, I wasn't enthralled with this, the filmmaking. I've talked about the writing. Mm. Um, I've talked about the dialogue. I thought Robert Downey I, Jr. was extraordinary. He was And I think Killian he deserves, Murphy, an, uh, deserves an Oscar. I thought Killian Murphy, Robert Downey Jr. Mm. and that scene with Emily Blunt are brilliant. Mm. Mm. Couldn't tell you any of the other names. Can, the can, we, can we talk about the actors? Can we talk about Bobby so, Safdie? So, so, is it Bobby Safdie? Yeah, Benny, like every, Benny there's so Safdie. many good actors so, in it. The, the, the skies are dark for all the stars that are in Barbie or Oppenheimer. Yeah. Um, my God, these two movies have... Everyone. Yeah. I, I think back to Gary Oldman going, everyone! Oh, Gary Oldman is in this movie. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Olden Ehrenreich is in this movie. Yeah. What, what's his face? Um, Jack uh, Quaid from, uh, from, from everything now. He's, when he's Kenneth Branagh everything. turns up. Yeah. Uh, as Niels Bohr. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, uh, Rami Malek. Yes. Yeah, that who, was weird. For the longest time, was like, are they casting Rami Malek and he doesn't have a speaking part? He's just in the background? Yeah. Oh my god, this is like the most like power move. Tom Conti played Albert Einstein. Now you chaps are too young, but back in my day, where there was this fabulous British... Tom Conti's British. Yeah. Uh, and, and there was this fabulous British film called Shirley Valentine. And Shirley Valentine is about a housewife who, who nips off to Greece, Greece, um, without her horrible husband. And she falls in love with Tom Conti. Am I allowed to swear on this podcast? Um, no, I'll, I'll just say it. I mean, you almost so, are with this. Last and name, so, <laughs> and she said, "Yeah, I know." And um, and she meets Tom Conti, who plays a a, a Greek fisherman, and uh, he says to her, "I want to make f with you," and she falls <laughs> in love with him. Anyway, so that to me is Tom Conti, not <laughs> Albert, Albert Einstein. Einstein. Whoops, so, his head fell off. But <laughs> he's he's good. it was good. Dane yeah. DeHaan. When was the last time we saw Dane DeHaan? Was so, well, you saw him in oh, that terrible oh, well, podcast did... that I didn't have to be part of. <laughs> The thingy of not water. The, the, um, the shape uh, of water. The no, shape no. of nothingness. Oh my god, that movie, that's right. He oh, was curable, a star. Incurable. A uh, cure for wellness. That's cure it, wellness. I got out of that one. Yes. I'd seen it. But, but before, you and I had seen him in that um that, that, that sci-fi movie, right? With um 
the Luc Besson, like crazy sci fi. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, Valerian. Uh, yes, yeah. And, and City of a Thousand Planets. So he hasn't yeah. done a lot that's great, but he, he was, was really, really good. good. He was really good. Who was he in Oppenheimer again? I'm trying to place him. He's one of the uh, soldiers, the military guys who goes to check in on Oppenheimer. Right. He's one and of the aides in a way, isn't yeah. he? He's like, yeah, I mean, he's, he's very a... dead eyed and mm. he's yeah. like, oh, this is really well cast. Mm. Um, yeah. But again, Casey oh. Affleck as well when he comes in it's like damn oh. do we still watch Casey Affleck I thought it had been cancelled <laughs> wow. all just a bunch of white men though innit so that's well, why that's, you I mean, know, you know yeah. well I, I have more, more names to read out Benny more Safdie white, more plays white Enrico men. Fermi okay. I think Matthew Modine when his voice came up it's like ah it's Matthew Modine <laughs> yeah. love that guy um, David Crumholtz, I, I think I said in our group chat, it's like Nolan's having a stealth reunion for 10 Things I Hate About You. He's oh, casting yeah, yeah. all these people for that movie. Um, so wait for Joseph Gordon-Levitt to turn up and then he'd be... Well, he is. Is he in the movie? In Inception. Oh, oh well, yeah. Yeah. In yeah, part, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, Tony Goldwyn is in this movie. Yeah. Um, he was from Ghost. And then Jason, <laughs> Jason Clark. Oh, anyway. Jason Clark's yeah. actually really good in this. Jason Clark doesn't get to do a lot of good stuff, but he's good in this. If you want to cast a scumbag this. that you just really want to hate, <laughs> it's that guy. Absolutely. I agree that the cast was amazing. When Gary Oldman turned up and Rami Malek, I was like, what is this yeah. movie? Yeah. But um, I, 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 can I say, out of the entire cast, the one that didn't hit for me. They were all bangers, apart from one guy. Unfortunately, it was El Olden Ehrenreich. Um, I, maybe my problem with him is probably his character. In the same way that America Ferreira really rubbed me the wrong way in Barbie, his character, which is just nameless aid, I guess, to Robert Downey Jr. It's like a poorly written Aaron Sorkin, that, Mike, isn't it? You know, it, like, yeah. well, Aaron Sorkin would do that much better with the, yeah. with the aid that has the kind of moral compass at the end <laughs> yeah, of the yeah, film. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's just, it, he reminds me a lot of, um, of Alan, Alan Page's character in, um, in Inception. Inception. Oh, right. Where it's like, so, what's this do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wait. Yeah. What are you thinking of again? And it's audience surrogate to the point of audience surrogate. Okay, yeah. so this is my biggest criticism of Oppenheimer, and it's my biggest criticism of Nolan for a while now. Um, no, that's not true. We all know my biggest criticism is about sound. But no, one, one of my biggest criticisms is the writing. I just think that two things. One, it's too long. Like, there needed to be an hour chopped out of that first <gasps> part of the film. An hour and chopped I out of Oppenheimer. Out. I almost walked out, <laughs> and I thought that was going to be my, like, uh, Did you see there, it in IMAX? For this yeah. thing. I walked out. Did you see it in IMAX or VMAX? Sort of VMAX. Which annoyed me as well. The moment that the thing came in, it wasn't Dolby at Mossiana. I thought, oh. right, you were dead to me, movie. So um, they didn't have the... No. I was so disappointed. Um, <laughs> but I just think that the, it's too long and too talky. Now, I don't mean that as a criticism for being too talky, but there are so many characters that are non-characters in this movie. They're just there to serve the exposition. I just... I just wanted more from the script. It's like this movie needed to go through some more workshops. Wait, you mean the editing. scene where Matt Damon goes like... I forgot who's in it, isn't it? Oh, oh yeah, no. we forgot to mention Matt Damon. He was amazing <laughs> in it. Or was it Jesse Plemons? No, it was Matt Damon. He was amazing <laughs> in it. I've, I've, see, I've forgotten who all these people are. That's how memorable their characters are. But he has that one line that's like, this is the most important thing in the history of the world. And say, like, oh, that's not a very good line. Well, I mean, it? honestly, I come back to that sequence where he says the famous, you know, now I've become the destroyer of worlds. Mm -hmm. And, and he's, and it's just like this awkward sex scene. That's just, I was like, what are you doing, Don't Nolan? you quote poetry during sex? <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I, mean, not, I not, think there's a resonance issue. Uh, <laughs> I guess Nolan probably does. Like, uh, I don't he think probably Nolan, does. Nolan doesn't. He uh, just... Anyway. Uh, I mean, the same um, issue, I mean, my issue with Tenet was that the actual core storyline was very basic. You know, mm -hmm. man saves woman from abusive relationship and they stretch it out over this three-hour movie. I didn't um, know that's what it was about. Totally. Oh, that's all that I movie is about. I just found it very confusing and I haven't gone back to it yet. We keep saying, oh, we must re-watch Tenet and then we go, let's put on ba -bang. All that movie is, there's literally a protagonist called The Protagonist, the protagonist. <laughs> and he's trying to save a woman from an abusive relationship and that's the story. So, going off what you were saying, Sarah, um, Jeremy, so you sent us that video of, you know, from when Tenet was released and this guy is like every Christmas Nolan movie ever. Oh! And he's just exposition really, dump. Exposition so dump, brilliant. confusion. Yeah. Mm. And, and people are like, I don't get Chris Nolan movies. And, I, and I'm always like, oh, you know, you poor summer child. <laughs> like, this is what's there not to get. Yeah. It's like, yeah, and Prestige, blah, 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 blah. And in Memento, it's the wrong way around. But Tenet is the one when I, I watched it, it was like, I 
don't understand what, what the heck is going on. And I think because the movie doesn't have a clear emotional drive. Uh-huh. Like, if you think about Batman Begins and uh, The Dark Knight, they have mm. really clear emotional oh, yeah. motivations. Yeah. You get to Dark Knight Rises, which I still love, but at the end of the day, it's a bomb movie, mm-hmm. right? At the end of the yeah. day, they're going to blow up a bomb in the sky. Right. And I th- that's when I started going, eh. Interstellar, whilst has a really clear emotional drive, I think the start of that film takes way oh, too yeah. long to get anywhere. And I just think it's that thing where a director gets more and more comfortable, more and more uh, yes men and yes women and yes people around them, and his movies are getting languid, I guess. Well, it's another word? bomb movie, isn't right. it? Right, <laughs> it is. It is. I mean, Tenet was was not quite bad. No, but not Tenet. But I know, Marvel. Oppen- Oppenheimer. Mm. Yeah. Oppen- <laughs> Oppenheimer. I mean, it's the same thing we see happening with, with Tarantino. His movies are getting oh, more yeah. and more bleh. Um, mm-hmm. And I just, I just, because you're right, I will watch anything with Nolan. I love Memento, Prestige, mm, mm, mm. Um, Inception, mm. Batman Begins, Dark Knight. Like, those movies are solid. And mm. I think I just want him to be a bit more edited. Mm. Yeah, right. Um, can we talk about Killian and Ryan? As Ryan, Ryan Gosling? Yes! Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they couldn't be more different in every way. And I think that Ryan Gosling was maybe a little bit tanned and, and those abs and things were a little bit full on. But his but eyebrow work. Mm, his eyebrow work is amazing. And yeah. isn't he a talented... Because we've seen him do extraordinary drama, Place Beyond yeah. the Pines and, you know, Blue Valentine and you name Drive. it. Mm. All of it. Blade just Runner. Extraordinary. But isn't he just a delight <laughs> in terms of sending things up, sending himself up, yeah. you know, or in sending Ken every up? Every single scene, I think. He and Margot Robbie just light up the screen. I, yeah. Like, the casting for Barbie cannot be any more perfect. Yeah. yeah. And it's weird, you, you kind of don't see Ryan Gosling as the himbo until he becomes the himbo. Mm. You're like, there could be no other choice. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I love that line as well where he's like, he loses interest in patriarchy when he finds out that it's not really about horses. Yeah. <laughs> Such a Which great is, idea. That was a weird thing. It's like, if there's one thing I know as a guy about girls' toys, is that girls' toys love horses. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I just, it was like, okay, like, obviously the, the whole cowboy motif and stuff. It's like, where are the horses? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, it's, it's, oh, sorry, speaking yeah, of toys, go. by the way. Um... Again, even though I didn't play with Barbie, I was alive around the time when most of the toys in the movie were coming out. And I remember the stuff. The pooping dog, when that came out, it's like, I saw that on a warehouse flyer and I remember thinking it was super creepy. My Um, mum said she remembered all of the Barbies bar, I think maybe the sugar daddy Barbie. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She she remembered all of them. The video screen Barbie? Or the one, the pregnant one that they... So, Midge. So, Midge in the film is played by the uh, Emerald Fennell, who is the writer and director of Promising Young Mm -hmm. Woman. Mm -hmm. So, British actress. She plays Camilla Parker Bowles in Mm -hmm. The Crown. Anyway, so she has the minuscule part of Midge, who was a pregnant (laughs) Barbie. So, Mm -hmm. I read up on this I thought this was just extraordinary so Midge uh, Midge came out in the whenevers um, and uh, probably early 80s I can't quite remember doesn't matter but point being she had a removable tummy with a, um, a fetus inside her tummy looking quite sort of biological and then eventually you know, for kids. right and then Mattel was like eh, no that's way too it's too on the nose it's not on the nose but it's just too much so they discontinued her um, so it's very cute that Midge has that tiny, tiny role because she's always just standing behind the fence, and, and it's a weird, pregnant. I sort of why is she weirding? Is a pregnant one weirding people out? And then I saw the thing in the in credits. Like, yeah. oh, I can see why that's weirding people out. <laughs> exactly. Um, Sarah, you were going to mention about how Barbie came to be. Was there, oh yes, was okay. There so um, so weirdly. Now, I read this, and I'm not reading it from the from Wikipedia now, so there may be people going, that's not quite right, but I believe it was. Ruth Handler originally... Um, sort of uh, designed Barbie sort of around a sex doll, which is why Barbie's vital statistics, you know, waist, mm. boobs and all that, are quite so pornographic. Wow. Um, and, I, and I can't remember all the ins and outs. Oh, suddenly there's oh. such an inappropriate... Like, <laughs> I can't remember all the ins and outs about... You know, for kids. Why <laughs> that? Yeah. But anyway, so originally that was the case. Um, and then, of course, Barbie did take on this the shape and I, I have a, a feeling although I can't corroborate this but I have a feeling 
that in more recent decades, Barbie's vital statistics might have um, changed ever so slightly to make mm-hmm. her a little bit more realistic. Well, um, you, you know that um, Margot Robbie, one of her key stipulations was, you know, if I'm going to do this film, I want there to be multiple Barbies. I don't want to be the um, Barbie. And yeah. so that's where the stereotypical Barbie comes yes, from. Yes, lovely. And of course, you know, you talk about Helen Mirren undercutting jokes. I do think one of the funniest moments is when she says... This argument would be much more uh, credi- cred- credible if we didn't have Margot Robbie playing her. Yeah, yeah. and I thought that was a good a good nod because otherwise where do we sit in there, us critics, yeah. scribbling it into our uh, notebooks? Uh, to me, you know? that joke just felt like it was for <clears> the <throat> naysayers. And it's like... Oh, uh, it I don't felt know. really cynical. It felt really cynical. Oh, I didn't oh, mind I that. Like, <laughs> funny. I, I didn't I, mind I, that. I had the moment. I thought the moment. I was like, oh gosh, it's a bit. You know, when you've got Margaret <laughs> Robbie saying, "I just don't feel like I'm pretty as Barbie," and you're like, yeah. "You're literally Barbie." Um, <laughs> well, not literally. But, you know, you, well, she is. Like she's playing it. I just thought, why is Margaret Robbie? And then, so that for me, that's it. Wasn't the naysayers. It was the fact that I was thinking that anyway. <clears> and then. The film it just was like, you know what, we, we've written the script, we know that this is a thing, let's just, <laughs> let's just do it. So Midge um, was originally Barbie's best friend, but um, because Mattel was worried that young girls wouldn't be able to identify with Barbie, but they'd be able to identify with Midge because she was ordinary, she had freckles, didn't wear a lot of makeup, and her wardrobe was a bit more ordinary. But then they got rid of her in 1967. And did you know that Alan was married to Midge? Oh. So that Alan Doll was Midge's husband. Anyway hilariously there was a growing up skipper doll and I think it was alluded to in one sentence now they brought out growing up skipper but the problem is there was a button that you would press and her boobs would grow that they they, showed in the movie and they had to get rid of that doll Um, and then there was video Barbie with the television in her back which they also show which is like like, the most year 2000 thing of all time right and it was just like (laughs) why why would you even want that but anyway the one that absolutely takes the cake for me now, yes, there was Palm Beach Sugar Daddy by yeah. Ken, uh. which is just extraordinary. But this one is terrible, and I'm whizzing through this article to try and find it. Oh, it's not even here. So, forgive me, you'll have to just take my word for it. There was a Barbie who was in a wheelchair, and her name was something like Smile Along Kate, mm-hmm. or something. And I'll have to look it up, and apologies, listeners, that I've got that slightly wrong. But she was in a wheelchair. So, how progressive. So, Barbie has a disabled friend, and that's a... Ma- oh, except that that this Barbie's wheelchair couldn't get through the doors in the dream house. Wow. And so, eventually... She can't go to any of these parties. She, oh, couldn't, wow. she couldn't get through the dream house, and so they discontinued her oh, rather wow. than change the... Dream um, house. I know. And on that note... <laughs> Isn't that oh, terrible? Wow. wow. So that's probably why my, my, my mother, um, who didn't know that she had all these objections, probably thought, well, we're not having Barbie, we'll have Cindy. All right. Thank you for listening to another episode of Cinema in Context. If you enjoy our podcast, consider signing up to our Patreon. Cinema in Context patrons receive access to exclusive minisodes, opportunities for one-on-one discussions about the films you love, and our extended episode catalogue including extended content of the episode you're listening to right now. Find out more at patreon.com forward slash cinema in context. You can listen to Cinema in Context on SoundCloud, Spotify, Radio Public, Stitcher, Amazon Music, and Apple Podcasts. You can also follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook, which are great places to let us know what you think of this episode, as well as give us suggestions for future films to discuss and compare. Look out for our next episode in a month's time, and until then, no more mai!